A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this podcast on Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and our guest host today is criminal defense attorney Allison Treasel and friend of the show. Welcome back, Allison. Oh, I'm so excited to be here, and especially for this one, Anna. I mean, there's few cases that have moved me like this one, where you have a, a really tough, sad story, but a real happy ending. Absolutely. And that's why this episode is special. We're doing things differently. We're going to look at one case. And also, we're going to be releasing this episode during the holidays because there is a glimmer of hope in this very sad criminal story. So let's not lose sight of that. What we're doing in this special episode is that we're going to do a deep dive into what happens when someone is falsely accused of a crime, convicted, sent to prison, and then the truth comes out. And the person is released. But after 20 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. Anna, this man spent 23 years, 10 months, and 25 days in prison for crimes that he didn't commit. I mean, let's think about how long that is. Two and a half decades. Awful. Awful. It is a lifetime. It is. It is a lifetime. And what we're going to examine is how did this happen? How do you get your life back? And what is justice in this case? Because frankly, you you can't give him his life back. And no. don't forget, there there are victims of crime on the other end waiting for real justice for the crimes that were done against them. There There has been a murder in this case. I absolutely agree, but I have to say in cases like this, um, well, they, their losses are awful and incalculable. You can never put a value on a life where someone is living incarcerated for year upon year, missing every Christmas, every birthday, every life event that you and I relish lynched. They're literally sitting in prison for something that they didn't do. Well, in order for you to understand this case, we have the man who was wrongly accused. We're going to have his attorney that helped to exonerate him and also the university that is working to prevent this from happening again. So our guest today is Willie T. Donald. He's an Indiana man who was wrongly convicted of robbery and of murder, and he served more than 20 years before being exonerated. We will discuss how Willie Donald went car shopping with his family and ended up in a police lineup for a crime that he did not commit, and he was the wrong man who was sent to prison. Also joining us will be Willie Donald's attorney, Thomas Vaines, Dr. Nikki Jackson, who's the coordinator of the criminal justice program at Purdue University Northwest in Indiana, who is the creator and the chair of the Willie T. Donald Exoneration Committee. So before we bring all our guests on, because we have the key players, so we're really going to understand this case. Allison, I want to go through what are the glaring problems with this? So when we get to the discussion, we can ask the questions, the hard questions. My headline for this case is... Nobody should spend the rest of their life in prison based solely on eyewitness identification, period, end of story. It is not sufficient. It is not reliable enough. And it is not the type of evidence that we should use standing alone to condemn someone to essentially die in prison. Period. Allison, it's my understanding from study after study that the least reliable people in a crime are the witnesses. That's right. Because, yes, they get some great details right, but the mind, the memory can be fallible. So I remember, I remember when, when right, one of my first 
uh, courses in law school. Okay, it was this great, uh, it was a criminal justice type of case in law school. And the professor had somebody run into the classroom. They ran into the classroom and they spent probably 10 seconds in the classroom and they ran out. And immediately we were asked to write down everything we remembered about that person to describe them in detail, what they looked like, how tall they were, what they weighed, what their nationality was, what they were wearing. Nobody got the exact answer right. And everybody, uh, everybody's answers were different from each other. Right. And you're all there in the same room, Correct. which is the problem with this case. So what happened was back in February of 1992, there were five armed robberies in Gary, Indiana. So there was there was a rash of these. They were holdups and, you know, people were having guns put to them and they they were being asked for their money. And in one case, um, a dad who had just come home with his fiance and his children um, fought back tried to hit the attacker, and that man was shot and killed, the, the, the victim, the hold victim. So the shooting, Anna, in fact, happened in front of the key eyewitnesses in the Donald case. Right. So think about the fact that she is experiencing the most stress she's ever experienced in her life. Never could there be more trauma. And they're relying on her identification to convict somebody. And so Willie Donald mugshot from a previous, we'll say run in with the police because he was never charged uh, when he was much younger involving a car, which we're going to get into. But the bottom line is that his mugshot was in the system. They knew that they were looking for a black man. And so when they brought in the victims of the crime to ID who had held them up and who had killed this dad, his photo was in, in the series of mugshots. Okay, so his photo is in the six pack, but let me tell you what I don't like immediately. And I, I'm so interested to talk to his attorney about this. Apparently, these witnesses, these crucial witnesses, are in the room together making the identification together. That's like textbook 101. Do not do that because they're going to highly influence each other. Right. And what they didn't know, what the defense did not know at the time, was that the police kept leading the witnesses toward Willie Donald. Then he's brought in for a live lineup, and some, some of the witnesses point to Willie Donald. Some do not because there were multiple uh, right. victims but at of some crime point, here. At, by the way, at that point, for a lot of people, it's already been tainted because they've already gotten the affirmation from the police that they picked the right person. So by the time they get to the live lineup, they're walking in with the confidence of the entire police department behind them, saying you picked them right the first time. So then all they have to do is look at the only familiar face to them. Right. And what the defense did not know at the time, and this is what led to the exoneration, was that the witnesses had been coaxed, pushed, led by police. And this is going to be my question when we get to everyone is apparently the police notes were found, notes that apparently confirmed that the witnesses were not sure that it was Willie Donald, and and those notes did not become available until after he was convicted, and that was part of the exoneration. Well, I think there's a couple Brady violations. So there's a couple. So anything that's favorable for the defense, they've got the prosecution's got to turn over. Okay, you got to turn it over. So we have as defense attorneys the same information that the prosecutor has, okay? This is not supposed to be a hide the ball kind of thing, right? The prosecutors are supposed to only convict guilty people, okay? So their goal is to seek the truth, not to seek convictions, to seek the truth. So not only was that not disclosed, but apparently, and let's add this to our list, I'm so excited to speak to these two, is that a couple of days after 
the robbery, one of the victims says that she saw the suspect again and she called the police to report it. Well, what what was never turned over to the defense was that Mr. Donald had an alibi for that time. The police were looking at his time card at his employment. And at the time that she saw the suspect, he was having lunch with his supervisor. It's it's unbelievable. Here again, I want to make sure no one loses sight of what you've just said here. The witness who is a victim calls the cops and says, oh, my God. He's across the street. The guy who held me up is across the street. Meanwhile, the cops are at Willie Donald's employment looking at his time cards and he's nearby. That's so right. we know for sure when she called and said, oh, my God, he's across the street. That was not him. Correct. But that was withheld from the trial. And there was no DNA evidence in this. There was no physical evidence, as far as I know, that was used to convict him. There, so there is no supporting evidence at all. Nothing. No fingerprints, no gun, no DNA, no confession. When they go to search his house, none of the clothes that the women that the people described at the crime scene are found in his house. None of their identification or any that these were robberies. Nothing that was taken in the robbery is found at his house. Literally zero supporting evidence. Zero. And he gets convicted. And this is what I want to hear about. How yeah. in the world were they able to get a conviction? I mean, I suppose that the witness testimony must have been very moving and overwhelming, but there was nothing else to support this. So so we those are the highlights of the case against him and the exoneration. So let's now get to the people involved who are gonna help explain this to us. Correct. So joining us now is attorney Thomas Vaines, who did not represent Willie T. Donald in the first case, but really you handled the exoneration. Uh, welcome to the program. We're so excited that you're here to help us try to understand what went wrong because so much went wrong. Anna, before he does that, before he does that, <laughs> Mr. Baines, I'm doing this to you. Sure. For a fellow criminal defense attorney, um, you saved a life. You saved Thank a you. life. You changed the lives of everybody that Timmy's ever touched. And my God, my hat off to you. I, I stand in awe. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you much. Absolutely. I mean, it's incredible work that you've done. So, Mr. Baines, can you explain to me, Allison and I were, were already discussing before you joined us, all the red flags that we saw, because this is basically a conviction that was based entirely on witness accounts, and witnesses are the least reliable. But they may be the most powerful to a jury. That's the problem. Uh, it was uh, Justice Brennan of the Supreme Court who once said that the most convincing thing to happen in the courtroom is to have a live person point a finger at a defendant and say, that's the one. Uh, you're right though, uh, as powerful as that may be, as important as that may be to the prosecution, it can be totally unreliable, and it was in this case. How did you get involved in the case? When did it come to you, and, and did you feel at that moment there's something seriously wrong here. I knew about the case from the beginning, as it turned out. Um, while Timmy was in trial, I was in an adjoining courtroom with a murder case of my own. And what happens when lawyers are on break is they gab with each other, congregate, they spitball ideas with each other, they will uh, gripe about their respective judges. That's a lot of what lawyers do is gripe about judges. And I was talking a lot with Timmy's lawyer at the time. And I was more than a little surprised, given what I knew uh, about the case, that it turned out to be a guilty, that he was convicted. I got myself involved in it a couple years later when Timmy's lawyer went off to become the mayor of the city of Gary. And he left something hanging, which I tried to resolve and resolve in Timmy's favor and get him a new trial. Um, it didn't work. Uh, so maybe a decade later in 
2005 or so, uh, his family came to me and uh, they were kind of at the desperate stage at that point. And it was, what can we do, if anything? So uh, knowing as much as I did about the case and feeling right from the start that this young man did not do these crimes, um, I decided to try to help him out. Mr. Baines, can I can I kind of hone in on that for a minute? You know, when you sit down with people, we, we kind of develop this gut instinct of um, whether the person did it or not. And this is sort of like a trade secret. Um, but I want to know, what is it that you saw during the trial or you, when you spoke to him or you spoke to his family, what was that trigger where you said, I've got an innocent man on my hands. What was that moment? You're right, by the way, 100% about the gut instinct. That's one of the ways you work as a lawyer. But the fact that stood out, that jumped out in this case, was the facial scarring described on the perpetrator. Every one of the victims that night described extreme or significant facial scarring uh, on the part of the man who did these robberies and shooting. Um, now, keep in mind that these crimes occurred at night, in winter, by a perpetrator wearing a hat. Uh, for the scarring to be that prominent under those circumstances, it must really have been bad. Uh, but if you look at Timmy, if you meet him for the first time, no one would ever say that this prime characteristic of Timmy Donald is facial scarring. So it was the absence of facial scarring that was the big flag that said they're barking up the wrong tree here. I, and I look, I, when I see something like that, if, if, if every single witness picks out some either facial characteristic or a prominent tattoo somewhere and my client doesn't have it or conversely, they have it, that aha moment is like, uh-oh. I've got myself a guilty one, or this person didn't do it. Absolutely. If the person doesn't have it, that's the drum you beat, 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 beat. And uh, that's, the, to me, was the big factor. In addition to the fact that they served the search warrant on his house right after he got arrested. He was in jail uh, when uh, they got a warrant and they went to his house. They didn't find a gun. They didn't find a black leather jacket that the perpetrator was wearing. The uh, offender was wearing something called a Kangol hat. They didn't find that. They found no robbery proceeds. Uh, they did a thorough search of his house and uncovered not one single bit of corroborating evidence in this case. What were, what were the color of the two witnesses that identified him? And the reason I'm asking that is you know, sometimes they have these cross-racial identifications that are very difficult. Was Correct. there an expert that was used there about that? No, there were no experts in the case. Rhonda, uh, the robbery victim, who was not physically harmed, uh, was African-American woman. Uh, Kim, uh, who was the wife of the man who was shot and killed, uh, was white. So you had a white identifying uh, Timmy and you had an African-American identifying Timmy. So, uh, but there were no experts called in this particular case. I think trial counsel, not me, trial counsel, sort of banked on the idea of what we talked about earlier, that the absence of scarring would carry the day. It didn't. So uh, the notes that apparently were kept by the police, which indicated that the witnesses who were also victims had some hesitation and didn't believe that it was Mr. Donald. How were those notes then found? Because I understand that the Medill Innocence Project, which is a project of the Northwestern University Medill School of Journalism, made this a project. Were they able to uncover some information? Uh, they did, but it wasn't the notes. What they uncovered is they tracked down Rhonda, the robbery victim. Uh, after all those years, they approached her. They got her to make a statement. Uh, they didn't get her to make a statement. She made a statement. Let's put it that way. She made a statement indicating, I've always been bothered by this case. I've always been 
felt bad for identifying him when I wasn't sure that it was him. And that opened that door to getting back into court on uh, her recantation of the identification. The note is a separate thing, Anna. Um, the original prosecutor in the case wasn't very forthcoming with any of this. Okay? I got lucky in that in 2007, 2008, somewhere around there, when a, a new prosecutor was involved, and that prosecutor had a lot more integrity. And he, in going through his file, came across these notes from the original prosecutor indicating witness doubt. That prosecutor had the um, integrity to turn him over to me, knowing that uh, he was shooting himself in the foot in doing so. Um, but that's his constitutional obligation, and thank God for him, he did it. Mr. Baines, has, has, has there been ever, has there been any uh, repercussions to either the officer, the investigating officers or the prosecuting attorney for these clear bright Brady violations? Anything at all? Zero. Nothing. Except such justice as may come from Timmy's lawsuit against the city of Gary and the detective who was involved in withholding some of this evidence. Uh, he's got a pending lawsuit. Maybe there'll be a little bit of justice there, but in terms of the criminal courts, or the police department, or the prosecutor's office, nothing. nothing. And I, I was reading that at the time that he was released, that you all didn't have any type of compensation for the wrong for the wrongly convicted. Am I right? As, and that has now changed. That has changed uh, in large part uh, thanks to Dr. Jackson. Uh, she uh, pushed and got the Indiana legislature to adopt a con compensation fund, there's a statute on point nowadays. Uh, but absent that, his remedy would have been what he's doing, which is a civil rights suit against the uh, uh, city and the detective. As we know, though, prosecutors are, by and large, they're immune from such suits. Um, Look, the, you know, and even, and even if they, they're found to be culpable in some way, they don't personally foot the bill. They don't foot the bill. It's the city that foots the bill, right? I mean, yeah. there's no personal liability, but yeah. it just, it just is, and, I, and I'll be excited to talk to professor, uh, the professor about it, because um, if you think that if they know that they can be personally liable and that there will be police action against them, or there is criminal action. Do you think that maybe that behavior would change and they'd be less zealous to, to accuse someone than to get it right? Yes, and as we both know, prosecutor misconduct along these lines, withholding favorable evidence from a defendant is a persistent problem. It happens all the time, all courts, every state. Uh, another thing that I think would probably help is if the appellate courts would start calling out uh, violating prosecutors by name. I've seen so many appellate opinions where prosecutorial misconduct comes up, um, and even if they find it, they don't identify the perpetrator, the prosecutor, by name in the appellate opinion. If you started getting burned publicly in appellate opinions, Yep. That also might help change some of the behavior. Agreed. I agree, because it's just the office, correct? Correct. It, they'll just yeah, refer the, to the prosecutor's office in the this case, or the state label. or the county. Correct. Right? Exactly. So, generic reference. So um, I want to understand, before we, we bring everybody else on, Mr. Baines, what was it the totality of, of these issues that led to the exoneration, or was there one piece that was the biggest? Because we have... Basically, the students who, you know, went back to one of the eyewitnesses and the eyewitness admitted, you know what, I can't say for sure I felt pressured. Then there are the notes that were withheld from the defense that indicated that the witnesses were a little queasy and unsure. And then there's that third component, which I think is incredibly strong, which is one of the witnesses calling the police saying, oh, my God, the guy who attacked me the other day is right outside. Yet Mr. Donald was nowhere nearby. Police were at his work. You know, he clearly could not have been that person. Was it all of those things or one of those things 
that led to the exoneration? It was everything in combination. Uh, we had originally sought a new trial on the basis of that phone call you mentioned there, uh, factor number three. That by itself didn't, didn't get him a new trial. That was tried back in 96 or something like that. So um, it was only after this new information came up about 10 years later uh, about Williams recanting her testimony about the suppressed or um, hidden notes, uh, put it all together, and that's what got him the new trial. Anna, can I ask him this question? So I was struck, and I'm always struck in these kinds of cases, and this is sort of a, a two-pronged question. There, there's a time when he's offered a plea deal. And if, he, and if he enters a guilty plea, then they set him free, okay? They set him free. And your client, was it a discussion that you had with him where you said, because look, I've been in that place where I say, I know you didn't do it, but I want you to come home. I want you out. Um, and did he say to you, I didn't do this. I cannot plead guilty to something I didn't do. So my two prong, my three prong question is: Was that a discussion that you had with him? And I know I'm I'm having you divulge things that you wouldn't normally share. Um, and what made them at this point uh, even come to the table with anything? Well, they came to the table because they were beginning to get worried. That's why that generally is what drives the prosecutor to offer anything. Uh, in this case, Allison, I wouldn't call it a plea offer. It was something even less than that. What they came to us with was a proposition where if he dropped his legal challenge to the murder conviction, for which he had already done his time, okay, and they would then drop the robbery conviction that he was still serving time for, okay, that was the one involving Williams who recanted her testimony. They would drop that. He would drop his legal challenge to the murder he would not have to admit he committed the murder. He would not have to plead guilty to anything. He would mm. not have to stipulate to having done any crime whatsoever. All he had to do was say, I'm going to stop fighting. I will quit fighting. I will let, let it go. He could have went home. Uh, Why didn't he? Sorry, Anna, but I, I, I need to know. No, I want to know, I mean, too. This is, this is, for me, this is sort of important. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm as strong as you. I would have said, take it. Let's come home. He, he did it as a matter of principle. He said that if he accepted it, and he was tempted a little bit for the prospect of going home, his family really wanted him to go home. Uh, I left it entirely up to him. But what he said was, if I quit fighting, people will assume that I committed this murder. And he's right. They would. They would have assumed it. They would assume that. He got out on some technicality. He was guilty of the crime of murder. And had he been innocent, he would have quit fighting. That's what people would have said about him. So he decided, I'm not going to surrender. And I also assume that by doing that, he would have then been prevented from bringing a civil civil rights claim. I mean, bringing a civil suit. Yeah, correct. He would have. Yeah. But the, there was never any discussion that was on his mind at that time. Uh result of him turning down that offer was he spent three more years in prison and he did it as a matter of principle. I've had guilty people. You've had guilty people. No one who no is one. guilty no one. Well, would have, have jumped at a deal like that. Absolutely jumped at it and worried about principle and integrity later. You know how it works uh, in those circumstances. Yeah. But uh, um, So as part of the exoneration... Yes. Has Mr. Donald been given a finding of factual innocence? No. Uh, unfortunately, Indiana does not have what some states have, like Illinois, just across the border from us here, 10 miles away. They have something called a certificate of innocence where you can petition the court for, and the court says, uh, ali, ali, oxen free, you're innocent. Um, Indiana has no such legal animal. Uh, meaning he's going to have to fight to get um, compensation um, from the state fund. He's going to have to prove his innocence in this federal lawsuit he has going now, the federal civil rights lawsuit. Unfortunately, Indiana doesn't have that. So he's got plenty of legal battles 
yet to fight to uh, uh, establish innocence. Uh, okay, I have to I have to interrupt you right there. Sure. So he has been exonerated, but he is not innocent. He's been exonerated as a practical matter. The prosecutor dismissed the case two days after he was granted a new trial. In light of everything that developed, there's no one going around saying anymore that he is guilty. So as a practical matter, he has been exonerated, but he's got nothing with seals, ribbons, or a judge's signature on it that says he's innocent. Everybody knows he is. Everybody's treating him as if he is, uh, as a practical matter, but uh, there's no piece of paper that says that. Wow. So joining us now for this segment is Dr. Nikki Jackson, who is the coordinator of the criminal justice program at Purdue University Northwest in Indiana. And she's also the creator and the chair of the Willie T. Donald Exoneration Committee. Welcome, Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much. We're very glad that you're here. We're very excited about the work you're doing but also joining us is Willie T. Donald. This is the reason we're here. This is the reason we're having this conversation. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. No problem. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, Allison, who is a criminal defense attorney and is just chomping at the bit to ask a bunch of questions. So I'm just going to let okay. Allison take and, it because she can't. The, fir the first thing I have to do is say to Timmy, Congratulations. Um, nobody, it. nobody understands the stairs that you have climbed to get where you are. Uh, nobody ever gets released. No one is ever found to have not committed the crime. And so, my God, I, um, I'm really so happy for you um, from the bottom of my heart because I know the struggle and I know how rare it is. So congratulations to you. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, Attorney Vines need a, a round of applause too. Oh, I already one gave him one of these. I, I already bowed him? down to him. If it weren't for him, would none of this be possible? He did an excellent job on my case. Incredible, incredible. And you know, and Dr. Jackson, I'm telling you, we need to duplicate you in every state in the country because innocent people routinely do get convicted. And without people like you and programs like yours, uh, they will languish in prison while being innocent forever. Thank you so much. Um, we're very excited about our program. The Willie T. Donald Exoneration Advisory Coalition um, was founded this, I created it this summer, and its purpose was threefold. And one was to raise public awareness the other was for policy reform. And the third purpose of this coalition was to help exonerees when they get out of prison. I was very fortunate to contact the director of the brand new uh, program called uh, the Exoneration Project at Notre Dame School of Law. And their director is the vice chair of my coalition. And so we are partnering with Notre Dame so when I receive cases from inmates actually all over the country, I just hand those over to him now and his law students review it to determine whether these this individual possibly could be innocent. So the Willie T. Donald Exoneration um, Advisory Coalition really is to help folks once they've been released. Um, so this is, it's really neat to have this marriage between Notre Dame and Purdue University Northwest um, because we we really believe we're going to be able to help people who have been wrongfully convicted like Mr. Donald. That's we like Allison said, we need to duplicate you in every state. Every state needs to have this level of of help because there isn't any. I, I you know, we've been talking this entire time about Willie T. Donald and likes to be called Timmy. So if I may, if I may call you when we refer to you occasionally as Timmy. Don't anyone get confused. All right, Mr. Donald, we are dying to hear your story. It is your turn. So I take me back to that day that when they say that this crime was being committed and they pointed the finger at you, where were you? I understand you were car shopping with family. Yes, I was car shopping with my sister and her then fiance, uh, my sister, Sheila, Donna at the time and her then fiance, uh, Dan Hopkins. How old are you at the time? 
Timmy, how old were uh, you? I was 23 or 24. Okay. Okay. So you're shopping for a car and... Oh, my sister. This- actually, my sister was shopping for a car. And you were doing the family thing and going along. Uh, I had just arrived home from work, and I usually tag along with them because I usually get a free meal when I tag along with them. So uh, I, I, I tagged along with them that particular night. Smart young man. What is interesting here, and this is something Mr. Vane's brought up in um, in a lot of what I've read. If things had been different and there had been surveillance cameras at the auto dealership where you had been, there would have been proof of where Mm -hmm. you were and at what time. Right. But they were relying on memories. The salespeople at the dealership said, oh, yeah, he was here. Oh, I can't remember exactly what time. Right. Is that what happened? Actually, when... uh we was uh, we visited the, the Maryville car dealership first. So my sister and her then fiance they was they was doing basically like the paperwork, uh, you know, pricing and financing and stuff like that. I was basically uh, going in cars, checking like you know during that time, you know, loud sound system was the thing. So I was going in cars, checking in, checking the sound system so I can you know, relay the message to my sister to tell her this the this the car she should get. Cause I basically wanted to drive the car anyway, but I was telling her that, you know, this the car she should get. So I wasn't actually with my I was with them, my sister now, but I wasn't actually with them when they was doing like uh pricing and financing and stuff like that. But you were at the dealership. I, I mean the there dealership. was no question. Yeah, I was at the dealership, but I wasn't when they was doing with the uh, uh, with the manager, I went with them when they were doing it. I was actually there, but I wasn't. I was in the cars, but I wasn't with them while they was doing their uh, paperwork with the uh, dealership. What I love about you, Mr. Donald, is that you are so specific that you are not missing a beat, that you're not sliding on the facts. You're like, I was there, but I wasn't in that room. I was in this room. And that is so important I get it. For you, the facts absolutely matter. It's shocking that you were convicted on witnesses without any evidence, any hard evidence. Timmy, where were you? It was it was several days later, right, that they come. Where are you when they arrest you? I mean, where, where? I was at home. And is anybody there with you? My uh, little sister was there when they came to uh, arrest me. And you have abs- you have no prior criminal record, and you have absolutely no idea why they are there. Well, they told me they was coming to uh, arrest me for a bench warrant, for a failure, for a traffic, for a failure to le- yield at a stop sign. That's what the original story they told me uh, when they came to my house. Is that true? Was there a bench warrant for you? I'll jump in here. Yeah, oh, I'm ahead. sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll jump in here on this one. There was a warrant for him as a result of a municipal court, uh, um, city of Gary, Gary City Court. It was for missing court date on his traffic ticket that is completely bogus. The court had no authority whatsoever to issue a warrant for not showing up on a traffic ticket. It wasn't a crime he was charged with in Gary City Court. It was just one of the Tickets, like he said, for blowing the stop sign. And uh, municipal courts had no business issuing warrants, but they did. So when he was picked up, uh, that part of the arrest was totally illegal. So so you get arrested for this traffic court violation, alleged traffic court violation. So what I'm trying to figure out, Mr. Vaines, at this time is... Is, is Mr. Donald already a suspect and has his photo already been passed by witnesses when he gets arrest, arrested on an unrelated charge? Uh, yeah, by that point in time, the two of the women, uh, the Rhonda Williams and Kim, the wife of the deceased uh, Bernard Jimenez, uh, they had been in to look at mug books and they had gone through and one of them tentatively picked out Timmy and the other picked out Timmy from these mug books, uh, 50, 100, 200, I forget how many 
Chat Wait a minute, Anna, I got to jump in because this was a big question of mine. Mr. Vaines, Timmy, are those two witnesses in the room together at the same time? Yes. Yes, they are. Oh. And they're talking to each other. And uh, nobody, there is no, there is a Gary police officer of lower rank in the room who is not paying any attention to what they're doing. They just put the books on a table and let the two witnesses begin going through. At one point, one of them got up and looked to see what the other one was pointing to. Yes, there was collaboration between these two witnesses. Is there a video camera in there? Is any of this being recorded? Not at all. Mm, and uh, Mr. Vines, Mr. Vines has also mentioned that uh, Rhonda Williams' mother was also in the room, too. Right. Now, I have a question here, and I don't know who can answer this. Why did the Gary police have a photo of Mr. Donald? Where did that come from? Back in, I think it was 88 or 87. Uh, a friend of mine's uncle, we wanted to borrow his car, so we wanted to go to the uh, the beach. was having some type of concert or something. We wanted to go to the beach, Marquette Beach. And uh, my friend's uncle's car, I had seen him driving the car numerous times, so I knew it was his car. But this one particular time, we got in the car, and uh, street, street talk, the neck of the car was peeled. It was disturbed. So it looked like somebody had... Uh, you know, uh, Jimmy the ignition. The ignition was gone. Mm -hmm. So I asked him uh, what was going on. He said he lost the key. But he showed my uh, his uh, nephew, which is my uh, childhood friend, he showed him how to, uh, you know, start the car up. So the car, the, the ignition was disturbed. The car wasn't stolen or nothing. So we took the car. We was driving to Marquette Beach. I mean, the car got, we was parked. And the police came and and uh, uh, took us to uh, Gary, took me to Gary Police Department and said that the uh, uh, the uh, car was stolen. But then his, uh, I told him, I told him, I told him the same story. And uh, and I told him about his uncle and I, we, uh, we got in contact with his uncle. His uncle brought the necessary paperwork up there to show him the car wasn't stolen. And I was released and I wasn't charged with the auto theft. So can someone explain to me then if Mr. Donald was never charged with a crime, but your mugshot has been sitting around there for all these years, why was it put in a mugshot book? I don't understand. Like, why? I'm not sure the Gary Police Department operates rationally. And um, let me point out something a little bit related to that. Nowadays, thanks to some changes in the law, Jimmy probably would have been able to get that arrest expunged. And that meant the picture could have been destroyed and it would no longer be in the mug book whatsoever. Uh, but that wasn't the situation back in 19, in the early 90s, 92, when uh, these crimes occurred. Um, laziness, that's the reason it's in the book, laziness on the part of the police department. Has there been a change in the Gary police policy or a change in the law that only actual convictions can you there, there was a policy in LA County Jail for a long time that if you were going to do a live lineup that they, they could they had to pay you or they had to give you some kind of incentive you know where you got an extra meal or something they couldn't just take you at random to do to be in a live lineup at the county jail um you you had to you had to volunteer for it right I mean uh, here Timmy is, and and his his picture uh, involuntarily is being used to to pin him to potentially pin him to something where he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Is is that still the procedure, Doctor? I'm not sure what the the law is on that, Mr. Baines. I think you just said that the law has been changed, correct? Well, the law has been changed to allow a person to expunge it if they take the initiative. But if someone like Timmy doesn't take the initiative to expunge the arrest, that picture will continue to sit there. And that's a scary thing because, yeah. as, we, as we see here, all it takes is someone pointing the finger. And soon your life is completely out of your control. That's right. So, Mr. Donald, at what point did you finally understand 
that you were being accused or that you were suspected of a murder and of a robbery. Did Were you getting a sense that something was going on or did you not find out until they actually charged you? Well, I got a sense. Uh, I got a sense when I was placed in the police car and it was like, uh, it was like a train of police cars following, following uh, us. So I got a sense that it was more, it was more uh, uh, than a, a, a traffic violation. Traffic violation. Okay. So when you finally get to the police station, then what happens? How long is it until someone starts having a conversation with you that you realize, oh my God, they think I'm the killer? Yeah. It was about a couple of hours. Uh, Officer Outlaw called me into the into a small office and he was telling me about these crimes that was committed this night. And he said it was committed on a Thursday uh, night. And I, I automatically knew that I was at the car dealership with my sister and her fiance. And plus I got paid on that night. So I automatically, uh, I got paid on a Thursday night. So, and I knew I went car shopping with my sister and them. So I knew I had nothing to do with them crimes. And I, and I, I expressed that to the officer. All of the witnesses said that the attacker had scarred skin that was either like a scar or very bad acne. Mm -hmm. I am looking at you, and I know for sure that in prison, you're not getting any facials, okay? (laughs) So I know Mm -hmm. that you've always Mm -hmm. had great skin, okay? I am looking at your skin, and it is flawless, sir. It is. I appreciate it. (laughs) <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> that, that was one of the that was one of the reasons because my the description of the they said the perpetrator complexion did not fit mine. So I, I, I that's what I was that's what blew blew my mind. That's what blew my family mind because the uh, description didn't uh, fit that uh, didn't fit me. So and so I, if I could just interject here, that's one of the things we we'd like to see police departments doing is well, they need to have a a, a better practice in their photo lineups and that the the pictures will align with the victim's descriptions of the suspect. Um, The fact that they pulled pictures of Mr. Donald who did not resemble the perpetrator is is unbelievable. I mean, I'm, I'm so outraged by this case. Every time I hear more about the story, I'm really bothered. I'm so bothered that people are so, and I think Mr. Vane said it, so lazy, so lazy that, you know, that they didn't seem to care to want to find out what the truth is. That's what bothers me so much that they took this man's life for 24 years. Um, uh, Anyway, I'll continue, um, you know, I'll I'll go on my soapbox later, but uh, the fact that they took this picture that didn't match the description that the victims had given to them I don't even understand that. I don't understand it. Do you, can you describe to us, Mr. Donald, as you're, you're, you know, you're sitting in jail. Now you're being questioned about a murder and this robbery. And the next thing you know, now, now you're being charged. So when you're charged, are you thinking, okay, I know that when I get to court, it's going to be okay because I didn't do it and there's no proof and so explain to me the process of, of did you, what was going on in court? Did you think it was going your way? Did you think, okay, once I get to court, I'm going to have my day? Well, I watched the movie, I watched the movie uh, a while back with Tom Selleck played in, The Innocent Man. So I knew after watching that movie, I know it was just a movie, but after watching that movie, I knew anything was possible in a in a, in a courtroom. So tell me, did you, how was it going in court? Were, did, you know, what was the evidence against you? Did you, what was the jury like? What can you share with us that is unique only to your experience sitting there accused? Actually, I remember the first day, I remember the first day of my attorney, Scott King, I remember the first thing I was so, I was so outraged at the uh, prosecutor kept, uh, 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 putting me in this light that I was this uh, murderer and killer and and all this, and he was uh, saying uh, unpleasant things about my family. 
And I had got so frustrated, I, I really told my attorney, I don't, I don't even want to go back in the courtroom. I don't even want to listen to that no more. So I was, I was, words can't describe how I felt in that courtroom that the week of that trial. And then when the verdict was read? I mean, my sister fainted, but my sister was pregnant, and it was, my family was crying. And I just, I just felt, I was just, I really didn't, I, I just really didn't want to live no more. I, that's how, that's how, that's, that's, that's how I felt at the time the verdict was read. At this point, who believed you? Because it must be really hard. You've been arrested, you've been convicted. And you're still saying, but I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Who believed you? Who oh, my family you? always stood by my side. And, and people that knew me, my coworkers, my friends, they always stood by my side. They know I wasn't capable of doing, doing those uh, things that I was accused of. Let me ask you this. When, when you were released, you know, the thing is, do you feel that some people still look at you, hear your story, and refuse to believe that you're innocent? Uh, that's that's hard for me to say. Like yeah. I said, my uh, people that really know me know yeah. that I was uh, wrongfully convicted, and uh, justice was served in 2016. I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's hard to get your good name back, and that's probably how I should have phrased it, because that's what I was getting at. How do you get your good name back? I mean, you can't uh, you can't worry about how people uh, feel about you, long as uh, my attorney uh, Thomas Vines, uh, my family and my friends know that I was wrongly convicted and I was in justice for serving two thousand and sixteen. That's that's good enough for me. Everybody that I've met that knows Mr. Donald. I, I don't think there's ever been a question that he is innocent. He's factually innocent of what he was convicted um, of. And when I first heard of Mr. Donald's story, I contacted the prosecutor's office because the prosecutor um, is a very good friend of mine. And I called him and I asked him, I just read this article about this man who spent 24 years in prison. Is he guilty? Um, did he get on a technicality or is he truly innocent? He said, this man is 100% innocent. And so one of the things that he expressed to me was that he had offered Mr. Donald an opportunity to get out of prison. And Mr. Donald did not accept the agreement. And so the prosecutor knew he was innocent when he said, no, thank you. And I have to ask Timmy about that. So Timmy, I I, um, I have been doing what your attorney uh, did for you for many, many years. And I did represent someone who was wrongly accused of a murder. And thankfully, she the case was dismissed against her. Um, but I don't know. I just don't know if she had sat in prison for 21 years and someone came to her and said, you know, you don't have to admit guilt. But you got to dismiss. You got to drop your murder appeal, and you got to drop any chances of a civil suit or whatever it is. Why didn't you take it, Timmy? I mean, three extra years in prison. What, that please tell me and 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 please share with our listeners where where did that strength come from? Uh uh, I guess you could say it's, it's the powerful uh, innocence. Uh, Mr. Vane worked so hard. Uh, the uh, but deal innocent. They believed in me. Mr. Vane believed in me. My family believed in me. I believe. I knew that I was. I I could not I had committed those crimes, and I I wouldn't accept a, uh, I wouldn't accept no plea bargain at that at that time. Keep in mind, too, that when he turned it down, when Timmy turned it down, there was no guarantee he was going to get out in three years. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if things had broken another way, he could have done five extra years. 
years or six extra years, or in theory, he could still be there uh, had he turned that down on a matter of principle, which is what he did. In fact, he I had asked the same question because I don't know if I have that kind of strength. If somebody had given me the opportunity to get out of prison, I don't know if I have that kind of uh, integrity that Mr. Donald has, and I, I may have just taken that, that deal. But when I asked Mr. Donald that, the first time I met him, he had said to me that they called my mama a liar. They called my family a liar. And I was not going to come out of prison until everybody knows that my family are not liars. I, I will never forget that conversation. And that was just so powerful. It's it's unimaginable. It's unimaginable. While you were in prison, you went back to school. You got Tell us about what, what degrees you worked on. Well, when I first entered prison, I I, uh, I had a limited education. I, uh, I think I dropped out when I was in the 10th grade. So uh, I managed to get my uh, GED while uh, I was incarcerated. Uh, then I uh, got my associate in biblical studies and a, a business degree and uh business administration. That's amazing. That's the part that makes me want to cry. <laughs> right. But the, you know? here's, here's the problem, though, with that those degrees. It's wonderful that he's got them. But how, once he's out of prison, how are we going to use those degrees? Right. And I right. remember him calling me and saying, um, I don't know how to do a resume or how do I explain where I've been for 24 years? I mean, those are legitimate questions. I mean, you have this college degree. It's amazing that you have it. Um, but is it just something on a piece of paper or is it something he's going to actually be able to use? And he hasn't been able to use his college degrees, unfortunately. Of course, of course, of course. I, I think it's just, it's a testament to Mr. Donald, yes. right? Yep. And this level of accomplishment, because no one can take that from you. It is yours, solely yours. No one else can claim that. It is you know, because like so many of you, I'm passionate about education because it is honestly the most incredible thing you you can have. And and because it's so solely yours, it's such an accomplishment in the middle of all of this darkness that you that you were enduring. Uh, uh, Mr. Donald, at what point did you believe things were turning and did you really think you were going to get out or did you not believe it until you actually got out? I didn't believe it. uh uh, uh, I went to a PC here. Uh, uh, Vains had uh, Attorney Vains. I was being Attorney Vains with a PC here. And post conviction. Post conviction. Post conviction. Thank you. Okay. Post conviction here. And I watched Mr. Vains uh, in action. Finally watched uh, Mr. Vains in action in the courtroom. And I got a better sense that. Things were looking brighter for me. Thank you. What was your first meal when you got out? What did you eat? What were you dying to have? Wait, before before even asking that, can you ask him where he what he did right when he got out of prison? Because I think that's very telling. Mr. Vaines, why don't you tell him where? Yeah, where Mr. Where Vaines probably could tell that story better than me. It's a great I'm story. Let you that? know the, the cameras on you. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. Uh, I had went. Uh, I had visited Mr. Vines at his office, and uh, I had asked Mr. Vines if he get in contact with my trial attorney, so he can, so I can uh, see him uh, while I was at Mr. Vines' office. So when he got out of prison, rather than going to get something to eat, which is what most people would probably do, mm -hmm. he actually stopped at the office and thanked Mr. Vines for working. Oh. Yeah, that's really powerful, really powerful. And then he went and ate, and you can share with them what you where, where you went to eat because it's pretty fun. It's pretty interesting. Uh, I went to uh, a Golden Corral, which is a buffet uh, a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I know. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and I thought I was gonna be able to uh, consume a lot that day, but the first plate I was. I was, I had tapped out on the first day. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. It's just too much. Yeah. It's too much. So um, can you share with us what your life is like now? Oh, if, uh, when I first got out, it was, it was, it was, it was, I, I have to admit it was difficult because uh, so much has changed. Uh, uh, technology and 
it was just hard for me to uh, it was hard for me to adjust, but I kept pushing forward. Did loved ones pass while you were incarcerated? I had a uh, my dad pass. Uh, I had a cousin pass. I had a few man a few a uh, few family members pass that I wasn't able to, to uh, attend a uh, funeral service. Heartbreaking. And, and just so you, just to, to remind everyone that at the time that Mr. Donald was released from prison, the state of Indiana had no services for those who've been wrongfully convicted. There were no apologies, there were no programs, there was nothing. Whereas in the state of Indiana, if you come out of prison and you were guilty, we do offer parole and, and services for those who were guilty. But we had nothing. And that's really why I got so involved with this, because I felt this was completely unfair, unjust, that this man's life was stolen from him for 24 years. And the state has done nothing to make reparations for Mr. Donald. I mean, he had a hard time when we first met even looking at me. He, he had a very hard time just sitting across, a, we're sitting at a diner. He doesn't know me. Um, I made lots of promises to Mr. Donald. And when I left uh, our, our breakfast, I went to my car and I just broke down because I thought, how am I going to keep up all the promises that I've made to a man who probably doesn't trust many people? Uh, but fortunately, I've been able to, uh, I think, I think Timmy will tell you, I've been able to keep up most of the promises that I made to him. The release from prison of an exoneree is a story that sometimes doesn't end well. We all know that. Sometimes they never do adjust to life on the outside. In this particular case, I think it's going to end well. And in part, that's uh, due to the character of Timmy. And it's a large part due to the help he's been given by Dr. Jackson. So more power to you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Vaines. I remember Timmy saying to me after we met, he said, not everybody has you. I have you in my corner, but not everybody has you. One of the things a lot of folks don't understand is health. Their health is different um, than it was when they were incarcerated. I mean, he was just a young man. Uh, dental care is not really uh, provided in prison. It should. And this is why we created this exoneration advisory coalition, because this isn't just Mr. Donald. Um, there's a lot of other folks who are, who are in this you know, unfortunate situation. We're very lucky that Mr. Donald had his sister and uh, brother-in-law, his mother, but not all exonerees, as Mr. Vaines has explained, has these folks. And that's why we, the, our coalition, myself, and a lot of other people really want to make sure that these folks are not sleeping on park benches, and they are. Uh, some of them are, and that's why some of them end up back in prison. We're not giving these folks the tools to get out and be productive members of society. And so we need to really go back and, and do a better job, any job, um, to make sure that folks like Mr. Donald will have somebody assist them. Um, you know, we worked on resumes, um, job interviewing, all sorts of things. And Mr. Donald, fortunately, does have a, a job right now. Um, but it's not going to take care of him for the rest of his life. He's got to save some money. Mr. Donald said to me, you have Social Security. You have pension. I have nothing. And that's really, um, that's really not fair. That's not fair. We need to hold people accountable for their actions. Dr. Jackson, you hit on something that I, I want to I talk about. No one has been held accountable for this miscarriage of justice. No one. How is anything ever going to change unless those who actively perverted the law to, I'm going to say, frame Mr. Donald mm -hmm. until they're held accountable? Well, I think that's a, a great question. I don't know what the answer is. What I do know is that today, as we watch with George Floyd, people are being held accountable for physical assaults against suspects, um, you know, uh, causing death to suspects. But when they maliciously or intentionally harm innocent people by hiding evidence, by tampering with evidence, whatever it is, 
they need to be, first and foremost, in my opinion, they need to be fired. They need to be removed from office. I mean, I do understand mistakes happen. I do. This is not a mistake, in my opinion. This is not a mistake. These people understood, these officers understood what the, the you know, proper practices were, and I don't believe they followed them. The prosecutor's office had the information, and they hid it, from my understanding, from the defense. That's problematic, and they should be held accountable. How do you give a man back 24 years of his life? Somebody explain that to me. I've asked this of prosecutors and police. How do you give this man's life back? I mean, he's not married. He doesn't have children. He doesn't know whether he's going to have to work for the rest of his life. And he believes he will have to. And that's not fair. Um, and I do believe these agencies should be held accountable, whether it's to provide compensation. I, I don't really know what the answer is. And that's something our coalition is, is addressing. Uh, Attorney Vance can attest to this. Uh, the Gary Police uh, Department got a long history of misconduct. And I think it's truly unfair that uh, they can collect pension and, uh, you know, retirement benefits. And I spent uh, close to 24 years. I can round it off to 24 years in prison for crimes I didn't commit. But they can go on with their life and collect their benefits and and all that. And and I don't got and I and, and I don't got no 401k, no Social Security or nothing. So how fair, uh, fair is that? Is that justice in America? Horrible. And, and think horrible. about if if we hadn't been able to find him a job, if we hadn't been able to find him a job, he'd have to, you know, he'd have to, I don't even know, can you draw unemployment? I'm not really sure how this all works if you haven't worked. The other factor that folks don't think about is when he got out of prison, I had reached out to a lot of senators and state reps and said, listen, we need to help this man. And we need to find him a job. Well, it dawned on me, we've got a problem. He doesn't have a driver's license. He doesn't have a car. In the state of Indiana, it's just like a 16-year-old. You have to wait. You have to apply. And you have to wait to get your driver's license. So for six months, he couldn't even get to a job if he wanted to. We don't have the bus system that urban areas have. So there's a lot of different things that that people don't really think about. Um, you know, it's hard enough that we, we or bad enough that we took away 24 years from this man, but we haven't done anything. And when I say we, we're, I'm talking about a state. We haven't done anything to try to help this man get transition back into society. And that's a real problem. Yeah. Unbelievable. This has been such an incredible discussion. Uh, Timmy's not really that, that, you know, he's very humble. Um, I really would love for people to know that we are going to create a GoFundMe for Mr. Donald. People, if they would be kind enough to go to that GoFundMe to help Mr. Donald get back on his feet, I, I would appreciate that. I, I love the idea that at least a journalism student was able to be part of the process of making this right instead of making it worse. Yeah. You know, uh, usually... <laughs> You usually hear about law students doing that, and I'm, you know, and the, glad to hear. And, and the they, put heart that, soul, they put they heart did. and soul into it. They were, they, they followed the case even after they graduated from Northwestern. They would still contact me. What's going on? What's new? How's, how's Timmy doing? Uh, so they really put heart and soul into the work there. Well, and if you, I think I say this for Anna, just being with the three of you for the short time that I have, um, it has touched my heart. I mean, it really, I will remember this. I will remember um, how wronged you have been to me. I will remember, Mr. Vane, that you did this case pro bono. And I know what that means. I mean, the yeah. hours upon hours and the heartache and the headache and mm -hmm. the amount of rejection that you get along the way, um, that victory is super sweet. But my God, there's a lot of peaks and valleys before then. Um, and then, you know, Professor, to hear what you're doing to change these people's lives, because you're right. It's great that they get out, but 24 years has been stolen. You can't get that back. And how do you pave a way forward? I mean, there were no cell phones when he went into custody. 
um, all the things that we take for granted. Um, you know, he doesn't even have training wheels on when he gets out. So, wow. And, and I think movie. I think what was really interesting about Mr. Donald, and you you have had the good fortune of meeting him, and I am very blessed to call him my friend. There's no question about it. Um, but when he got out of prison, my son had had some medical issues. And let me tell you, the man who called me almost daily to check in was Mr. Donald to see how my son was doing. Um, he, he put somebody else before himself, and I will never forget that. And everyone who meets him just truly falls in love with him because he's just truly a good man, a very good man. And I think Mr. Vane said it well, the, the journalism students, they do check in on him. I mean, one of those students reached out to me and said, how's he doing? What's he up to? So I think it's, it's, it's very telling about who he is as a person. And I sit on two prison boards. I sit on two prison boards and he had spent time at both of those prisons. And I went to both of the wardens and I had asked them if they knew Mr. Donald and they said no. And I said, how could this be? He spent over you know, a decade in your prison. And, um, you know, I don't remember how much time he spent in the other prison. And the one of the wardens said to me, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We don't know who he is. He was never a troublemaker. And that has always stuck with me. Um, so I, I think just knowing him and knowing the good work that he's doing, and I want everyone to keep in mind that every time he goes to speak about wrongful convictions, every forum that we've hosted at the university, he's never been financially compensated. He has given up a lot of time, a lot of energy to try to help other exonerees, not just himself. The one thing we haven't asked you, Mr. Donald, is in your heart, do you hold any resentment or how do you deal with what's been done to you? Uh, I think uh, Tony Vance can remember this. So uh, when I did my first interview when I got out, uh, out of prison in his, uh, in his office, no one want to spend 24 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. And I can honestly say that. But the people I have met along the way, it don't even it out, but it 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 it, it, it kind of smooths it over a little bit. Wow. Good answer. So yeah, wow. very healing. It's so healing that the you know, that the good people who who brought some good into your I life. Mean, I've met some amazing people since I've been out. I consider uh, uh, Mr. Vane's a brother, and I consider uh, Dr. Jackson a sister. So, long as you I got can. a nice family there. <laughs> we're, we're very blessed. I mean, he brings us gifts. In fact, today he brought me a birthday gift. I mean, Aww. he is just an incredible, incredible man. And, um, you know, we've just got to right this wrong. And I say that all the time. We've got to right this wrong. You need and to write a book. You all need to write a book. I would read it over and over again. So I have a book that I'm working on right now. It's an academic book um, with pu publishers already accepted it. And we're hoping that it will be out in 2021. And the first story is about Mr. Donald. And I asked him if it was okay if I shared his story and he said, absolutely. And so um, I'm very um, excited and I'm honored to be able to share his nightmare is what I call it, his ordeal um, with the rest of, of the, you know, with the world really. Um, he, he deserves so much. I tell him this all the time. I can never give him back the 24 years that, that was stolen from him and they were stolen. Um, all we can do right now is make sure that, you know, he is safe, he is healthy, and he is going to be okay. And that's what I think Mr. Baines and I and all those who know him, that's all we want is what's in his best interest. And I'm so grateful to all of you for, for showcasing his case because he's such a, a, a quiet man and doesn't really like telling his story too much um, because he's super private. But I think the world needs to hear this and know that this can happen to anybody. And one of the things that I always share when I do these events and forums, if you're ever in a situation like Mr. Donald, make sure you get an attorney. Oftentimes, innocent people think we don't need an attorney because we're innocent. So I have nothing to hide. End of the day, 
always get an attorney. Correct, Mr. Baines? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the stage he was at in post-conviction, a lot of these inmates come into court without attorneys. I feel for them. Um, they're lost. Uh, you've seen it, Jimmy. Uh, by that stage, and you know, after you've been in prison 10, 15 years, you have no friends. You're by yourself. And it's quite pathetic to see um, people, innocent people, struggle by themselves to have the system uh, uh, see the light. Well, I want to thank all of you. This has been an incredible education. The fact that you have shared your story with us and you've enlightened us about the horrors of what can happen when someone is wrongly convicted. Thank you, Mr. Baines. Thank you, Mr. Donald. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And of course, thank you, Allison. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. Wow, Allison, that was an unbelievable conversation. What is your takeaway on all of this? Chills. I have chills. I mean, I, you know, these are these are once in a lifetime moments, you know, where you 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 got to spend the time with the person who spent decades in prison for a crime that he didn't commit. He he is he is certainly not the only one that this happened to, but his story is so moving and hurtful, and, and with a with a happy ending and with a support system. Um, I really think that that this conversation and and hopefully for the listeners will have the impact on them that it's had on me. It, it makes you want to give money to programs like the Innocence Project and to the professor's cause because you're really changing lives. It's incredible. We're going to have links to all of these programs, to the uh, coalition and to the committees, and also there's a GoFundMe page that is being established. We will link to all of those in our description boxes for this podcast. And I want to thank you for guiding us through this conversation. I believe that your experience was invaluable in, in taking us into those back rooms and those conversations that you never get a chance to hear how everything went down. Anna, th this was so much more my pleasure. I um, you know, you, you can practice law for 25 years and never have an experience like this. Um, this is what we, why do we do this? And um, to, to be able to talk to someone who has, who has been, who has been wrongly accused and now is on the other end. But what, what shocked me, Anna, and what I love the most, did you see his spirit and how positive and he doesn't hold grudges. I mean, he he needs to teach us all some humility and forgiveness. Um, you know, during during the holidays, he is the model of who we should be. Absolutely. Allison, thank you again for joining us. Where can people find you if they need someone like you? So obviously, I am a criminal defense attorney in Los Angeles. My uh, office is the law offices of Allison Treasel. I am the legal expert at KTLA, and I'm also the legal expert at Access Hollywood. All right. And I'm Anna G News on all social media. That's Anna with one N. We really want to hear your comments on this case. I think it's going to be fascinating, the discussion that's going to come as a result of this episode. This has been a special edition of True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm Anna Garcia, your host, and I thank you and I wish you all a happy and a very healthy new year.